here at Mount Vernon inside George Washington's Whiskey Distillery. And we're going to talk a little bit about the history of this place and also how whiskey was made in the 18th century and, of course, how we do the same methods here today. And we also have some other things to show you inside. So for Washington, this is the last commercial business of his lifetime, so he really doesn't get into whiskey until after the presidency. The way whiskey comes to Mount Vernon is through Scotland, and he hires a farm manager in 1796 named James Anderson, who was a distiller in Scotland and a merchant, and so he is the man with the idea, writes Washington a letter, and proposes a big distillery here behind his water-powered gristmill. Initially, Washington is hesitant about this, and there's a couple reasons for that. First reason is he's been pretty busy the last eight years as president, and he's finally looking to retirement, and he's 65 years of age, so I think George Washington was not thinking, I'll come home and I'll build another major commercial business. The second reason is quite humorous to us today, but a letter exists where Washington writes a friend and he said, I have many idlers at my mill. So mills are meeting places and General Washington was concerned if whiskey was being made down here, if there might be people that might come down and cause some trouble. It never happens, right? Um, the third reason is Washington really didn't know a lot about the business side of whiskey, so he had to really get educated on that side of running a business. But ultimately what convinced him was there was a lot of profit to be made in whiskey. It's a profitable business today. And for George Washington, this becomes one of his most profitable enterprises late in his life. Now, the original distillery, distillery carried on after his death. So it burned down in 1814. His nephew was running it. So what we're standing in is a very accurate recreation or reconstruction of that distillery. The way this was achieved was through research and archaeology. So Mount Vernon has a very good archaeological department and uh, preservation department. And they worked here six years to uncover the remains of the distillery. So everything in here is placed based on that archaeology. I'm standing next to a 210 gallon copper boiler and this is where the fermentation process really starts because you have to cook the grain and then ferment it. Uh, the creek water out here is pretty nasty so that's not going to be used to make the whiskey out of it. But there's a freshwater well behind the distillery. Fresh water was brought in, they'd stoke this with a wood fire, get it up to boiling temperature and we do everything the same methods today when we make our batches so this is one of the tools of our trade which is uh, a ladle holds about a gallon of water. So our first steps in making our whiskey is we have to get the grains in here in about 110 gallons of scalding hot water. And so it goes like this manner. Um, it's always nice when the fermenters, these, this first row, but as you can imagine, when we distill, there's fermenters across all these rows back here. So there's a lot of carrying of water. In here goes corn and rye. Washington made a rye whiskey that was prevalent in the 18th century. A lot of Americans enjoyed it. So certainly corn whiskey existed. Uh, rum had been big in the colonies since the beginning because we were a British colony, but post-revolution is where you see the production of whiskey and the consumption of whiskey really take off and rum consumption drops. Um, so corn and rye go in here. Our whiskey is about 60% rye, about 30 to 35% corn. And this is the other tool of our trade, which we, we row by hand. So this is a mash rake. So as the water's going in, another person's pouring the grain. And then I do a lot of standing here during our runs of rowing this mash. You're cooking the grain to break down the starches in the grain, and then you let it cool for a period of time. And when the temperature is right in here, you're going to add malted barley. Malt has enzymes that will convert starch to sugar, so the whole point of this exercise is to make a bunch of sugar off your grain. And then when it cools again to the proper temperature, we'll then pitch our yeast and we'll let it ferment for three days. Um, Fermentation works by the yeast eating that sugar, converting it to alcohol. It does put off CO2 gas as it does that. After about three days, this will settle down and be fit for the still. From here, it's another bucket brigade because we have to get it over to these copper pot stills. We have five stills just as Washington did. These were made by, by Bendome Copper and Brass Works in Louisville, Kentucky. They've been a great partner with us. A lot of great partners involved in our distillery over the years. So they made these period accurate stills for us. And the heads of the stills are called onions, so they can come off, and therefore we can bucket that mash to fill the pot stills. And we'll fill all five of them. Uh, we do about three, run about three fermenters a day, and then what we have to do is get the onion back on top. So that's this here. Cap the still, and then you'll connect the piping here. And then you're ready to build your fire. So. We are a direct wood-fired still, so uh, we've gotten better at that over the years. There's a lot of learning curve on that because uh, we have no dials, no control, no way to know really what the temperature is inside that still. So it just becomes by doing that you learn. So we'll build a wood fire up under that still, heating up that mash. And when the temperature reaches about 172 Fahrenheit to 173 Fahrenheit, that's at the point where alcohol will turn to vapor. 
So the alcohol boils off first. So it'll float up to the head of the still, collect in the onion. It'll build up pressure and start to force its way down that line arm. And when we're running these stills, we can just gently touch and tell where the spirit's traveling. It'll then go down here to this curved pipe, and inside this barrel is a spiraled coil. It's the condenser, um, uh, called the worm, highly technical term, and this is the worm tub. So what happens next is we have hot gas coming down into the coil. What we need to do is convert that back into liquid, and that's where the mill race water comes into play, because Washington's water-powered mills grinding all the grain for this mash. We do that today as well. And then that cool water that's diverted off the mill race comes in a wooden trough, and we can send water down into this barrel. I'll turn it on just a little bit here. So cool running water always flowing into here, keeping the water level high, keeping the pipe cool. We have a drain in front to let excess water out, so as it fills, it's just bleeding out. And your gas will cool down, turn back into liquid, and your distillate will come out the back over here. This is where the pipe dead ends. So one of the jokes around here on tour is don't drink the water coming out the front. It does happen on tour occasionally. People want whiskey. We understand that. But it's comical sometimes when people get there before you and they've already got some of that creek water in the morning and they think they've had their whiskey. You turn this down a little bit. So when we're running all five stills, the water flow through the building is pretty pronounced. And if you think of the Washington's time and how much whiskey was made here, it's pretty tremendous effort. In 1798, the first year the distillery ran, they made 4,500 gallons of whiskey. In 1799, the last year of Washington's life, this building produced 10,942 gallons of whiskey and small amounts of peach and apple brandy. So I think it's interesting that Washington was very reluctant at first to get involved in whiskey, realized the profit potential, and then was able to produce so much. Now working in here are eight men, and six of them are enslaved workers between the age of 24 and 14. I think James is the oldest at 24, Timothy is the youngest at 14. And these men had hard work in here, with bucketing mash, rowing, rowing the mash, hauling grain, moving barrels around, running these stills. He had two paid staff here. James Anderson's son, John, was the daily manager here, so he lived in the building and oversaw the work and worked along with everyone, and he had a paid assistant distiller. So when we work in here, we have eight or nine people on a day. It, it's about right. Uh, too many more people than that, and we're just bumping into each other. So it's interesting back then, the methods they used and the number of staff they had mirrors what we do today. Now this building opened in 2007, so it's been 10, 11 years. Uh, I, I came right before the distillery opened. And initially, we didn't think we'd run the stills much. We made one small barrel at the opening in 2007. Jimmy Russell was here, Dave Pickerel was here, Joe Dangler, who made Virginia Gentleman for years, a uh, bunch of other distillers. And we thought, okay, that was fun, that was it. But in 2009, we made our first run, very small run, we set 12 fermenters, and that sold so well, it's just progressed from there to where we make whiskey twice a year. And we've done some special projects as well over the years, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, we also barrel age more uh, than we used to. In Washington's time, whiskey wasn't aged, so it was all white whiskey. Good for George Washington, because he could make it one day and send it into town the next day, and the cash came right back. So in Washington's economic history here at Mount Vernon, you have a lot of products that are overseas markets. Initially, it was tobacco, later flour export. He had to wait for his return. So when whiskey comes to Mount Vernon, he now has a local commodity that's sold nine miles down the road in Alexandria, Virginia, and very profitable. So. I think that part of it, Washington was certainly pleased. And there's a wonderful letter where he says, business is brisk at my distillery. So um, he enjoyed making a good profit, and this place certainly provided that. In fact, it provided most of the profit in 1798 and 99 for this plantation. Now, if we come back over here, I want to show you some of the products that we've done over the years and, and talk a little bit about them. Um, again, the unaged whiskey is where it all started. In Washington's day, they didn't bottle, so this would have been in casks of various size and taken to town, but those casks were not charred, so the whiskey never picked up any color or flavor from the barrel. So this is our unaged rye. This is a batch from 2016B, batch, the November run, and it's 86 proof. And uh, we redid our labels recently in the last couple of years, so we really like the label. We're happy with that. And this is available at Mount Vernon gift shops only. Um, so from the rye, we then decided let's age some of that. So for a number of years, we've been offering a two-year-old rye 
Um, we age generally in small barrels, but in the last few years we've moved into 53 gallon barrels as well, so we're, we're moving to the industry standard barrel. So this is two years old. You see what the barrel can do for it in color. The flavor is very nice. Being rice, very spicy and peppery. Um, so that's our two year rye. And just recently, and there's a few bottles of this left in the gift shop, we have released our second batch of four year old rye. And this is a blend of two barrels. Very similar, similar label. The coloring is just a little different on the neck and the, the blue uh, color of the writing. So this is one of, probably the best whiskey we've released to date from our building. Although the March run of unaged rye is our best rye run that we've done to date, I think. So what we're looking to do is age stuff a little longer, we hope, down the road. And, and we have a number of barrels in that profile going that direction. Now over the years, we also have done peach and apple brandy because Washington did peach and apple brandy. And we're fortunate to have the ledgers. So in addition to all the archaeology that we had, we had the ledgers here to tell us the story. So we've been through those with a fine tooth comb and realized that small amounts of peach and apple brandy were, were made here. Some used in the mansion, but he did sell small amounts. And Washington, like any estate owner, had orchards on his property from which the fruit was gathered. So a few years ago, we did a peach brandy, and this is a peach eau de vie. Uh, actually, this is a little bit of the aged brandy. This was actually in a, a, a used bourbon barrel for a short bit of time. And that's our old label, um, but the, this sold very well. This was a very nice brandy. We worked with some craft distillers on this one, uh, Thomas McKenzie, Ted Huber, um, people like that who really taught us a lot. Um, Apple brandy, this is our latest batch. This was aged 22 months in a used bourbon barrel from A. Smith Bowman Distillery. They've been good friends of ours down in Fredericksburg, Virginia. This is the best apple brandy to date. Again, this one was made with Thomas McKenzie. Um, now, over the years, we've had some specialty projects that we've done. And one of the most neat things we did was make a single malt whiskey. And this was to tie in the 100th anniversary of the Scotch Whiskey Association. And so the, they came to us and the Distilled Spirits Council joined them and we brought three Scottish distillers here to Mount Vernon to make this single malt. Um, Bill Lumsden of Glenmore G, Andy Camp from Cardew, and John Campbell from Lafroy. And we had grain shipped from Scotland, malt that I ground in the mill and we fermented here, uh, and then ran the stills with them. Dave Pickerel helped with all that. He was our consultant then. And we made a small amount of this for fundraising. So there's two varieties. This is single distilled came off so, uh, with such a good taste and about 102.3 proof that all the Scottish distillers and Dave said, let's just barrel that. Uh, it was aged two years, eight months in a reconditioned bourbon barrel set back from Scotland and then we finished it in a Madeira barrel. And actually one of these is the Madeira barrels right here that we finished it in for four months. So the project was about tying together a lot of history. Washington's favorite drink was Madeira. We have the Scottish connection with James Anderson, 100th anniversary of the Scotch Whiskey Association. All this came about to, to make this very special uh, set of bottles. And there's only 60 of these that exist, and they've been auctioned for various fundraising efforts for Mount Vernon and other charities. Um, this spring, we ventured outside the whiskey por portfolio and made rum, and this was a great project. Um, Mount Vernon's releasing Washington's Barbados diaries when he was 19 years old. It's the only trip outside of North America was with his older brother, Lawrence, who had tuberculosis. They thought the Caribbean air would help Lawrence. Washington accompanies him, gets exposed to travel on the sea, to markets in the Caribbean, and, and to Barbados economics and sugar and the rum culture. And so our fundraising office said, could you make rum? And I said, well, I think we can, but I needed some key people to help us. And one of them was our, our key consultant now, Lisa Wicker, who's a distiller for Samson and Surrey. And Lisa had made rum uh, prior and made, uh, helped us tremendously with whiskey the last two and a half years. And so she said, well, let's, let's do that, but let's also contact Maggie Campbell of Privateer Rum. So Maggie and Lisa were our key people that came here and helped us ferment this 100% molasses and showed us how to, how to run rum, and it was very successful. And these unaged bottles were, again, for fundraising for Mount Vernon. However, we have more rum, so we put it in barrels. And this is one of them right here, and this is aging quite nicely. And so it's got a little bit of color. It's in a used bourbon barrel. Uh, it is the morning, but me and the crew here somehow will have to figure out what to do with these samples after our question period is over. Um, but this used bourbon barrel will carry it forward a little further. Um, Lisa will be back, I think, in November to help us with our next run, and so we'll have her check these barrels to see wh where she thinks it is and, and what we can do then to bottle this soon. But that'll be an amber run. 
We also age the brandies. So we have apple brandy aging here. This just got into the barrel not too long ago, January of this year. So this has got a ways to go, but just a little bit of time in the barrel. You can get light straw, just a little bit. You can see that already. So um, we're gonna give it more time in the barrel. The last batch of apple, as I said, went 22 months. So we just get, that needs more time. Uh, over here, we've got peach brandy. And again, it's been in here since the beginning of the year. There's a little color to that, but we're gonna give it more time. Also in a used bourbon barrel. I think, Ethan, you can help me later with this. Is that right? And this is one of our 53 gallon rye barrels. And so this is uh, from a, a recent batch and just a little bit of time in the barrel with, with a fresh new barrel of number three char, you can see the color that's picked up already into the whiskey. So that flavor component, the char of the barrel gives it the color and flavor you want. So we're gonna carry that at least two years, maybe a little longer. It might be a four year old batch. We're not sure. Um, so in 2016, we did change our, our way we ferment and run the stills. We've begun to improve every time. And, and again, thanks to Lisa Wicker's help, we ferment so much better. We're having better year, yields, better flavored whiskey. And we're really proud of the batches we've made in recent years. Um, I mentioned 2007 is when we opened. In 2017, we decided to do a 10 year anniversary of the distillery. So we brought in a bunch of the distillers who have helped us before. Uh, and some others that we hadn't worked with yet. And we did a special distillation run here in October of last year. And we created a small batch, which we're, we're aging in these barrels here. And we're gonna carry this on and, and have a barrel finish on this most likely once it has more time in the oak. But these are some of the folks that worked with us on this uh, uh, and some of our staff. Uh, Fred No of Jim Beam was here. Um, Joe Dangler, who still helps us. He made Virginia Gentleman for many years. Um, of course, Lisa I've mentioned, Dave Pickerel I've mentioned, uh, Wesley Henderson, the Angels Indy, um, a lot of the craft distilling world, Ted Huber was here, so some people from Wild Turkey. This is one of the neatest things we get to do, like they talked about the scotch, is these distillers love distilling history. Uh, they've read it, they're into it, they want to know more about it. So the opportunity to come here and work in this building and run these wood-fired stills is something that really attracts them. And for the benefit of me and my staff is we get to work with these talented people and we learn from everyone. So um, this was a really great project and we're gonna really enjoy bottling this down the road, probably with a 10th anniversary label. Um, but I do think I've said this other places that George Washington brings people together. He certainly did in the 18th century. He brought the country together. The constitution was formed under his leadership. And this particular part of the story, whether you come to Mount Vernon to see the mansion or his farm or anything that you see here, um, people have meetings of the minds here at Mount Vernon, so wh whatever the topic. So in the distillery, you have people that come from all walks of life, maybe they're entrepreneurial people or they're, they're distillers, and um, sometimes traditional millers come here. And so that's what I love most and our team lo loves most is getting everyone together and working together on these special projects. Um, so I'll open it up to questions. I'm sure we have some, and I wanna let you know it is October, but the Gristmill and Distillery is open through October 31st. This site's open April 1st through October 31st for tours, the Gristmill runs every day. And so please come out before the end of the year, or end of our season, and then we'll go into our off season, which is where we do production and other things, maintenance to the site. So, but happy to answer any questions anyone might have. Yeah, we got a lot of questions, Steve. Thank you for that amazing tour. Um, we have a, several people wondering where they can buy the whiskey and if they can purchase it online. You cannot purchase online. That's just the, the law. You, we can't ship this product, so you need to come to Mount Vernon to purchase it. This gift shop at the mill is open through October 31st, but our main gift shop on the estate is open 365. You can buy it right there. On Sundays in Virginia, you can't buy alcohol till 1 p.m. Keep that in mind that they'll be there to sell. And everything's in stock right now. Single malt and rum aren't on the table, but all the brandies and the whiskeys are for sale at the, main, at the shop, at the estate and this shop right here. Very good, and Amelia's wondering if we can still buy the peach brandy? Yeah, peach brandy's in stock right now and also a peach eau de vie. Very and good. the eau de vie is really nice, so an unaged brandy, so that's available. I think there's about two or 300 bottles of that left. Great, and Denise is wondering what the highest proof you have here. Oh, when you run the stills, because you do double distill everything, so after the first pass, that, that spirit, that low wine goes back in, you don't want to go above 160 proof. You can't do that legally for whiskey. So when we double distill, the proofs that are coming off are between 145 to 155. You don't want to drink that. 
you want to cut that down. We barrel at between 100 and 110 proof, depending on the barrel. And then everything gets cut to 86 proof. However, down the road, I can see us releasing a cast strength whiskey. That's one of my goals in the coming years. So that'll just be whatever proof comes out of the barrel, which would be most likely between 104 and 110 proof. Very good. And John is wondering if, if or why Washington didn't age his whiskey. He didn't age it because the market uh, was the way it was. People drank it unaged. And so um, and they knew of aging in the 18th century, and certain spirits were aged in Europe. But the cost of waiting for that, uh, it just wasn't done economically in that time period. So if people are going to consume it unaged, and you can get your profit right then, that's the way to go. And in fact, the aging of spirits is a regular part of the process. Really doesn't begin sometimes until the 18 teens, as far as we can pin it down historically. So in this time period, it just wasn't done. Okay, interesting. And Lisa and Cindy are wondering if Mount Vernon grows the grains that you use at the distillery here. Unfortunately, we don't grow the grain, and that's just a, an issue about the amount of acreage we have. I wish we had more of Washington's original farm because Washington owned 8,000 acres. We have about 540 acres, and so we just can't sustain the milling and distilling. So I use mostly Virginia grain. Um, sometimes I have to go out of state for certain things, but we have a farm in Tidewater, Virginia that we get our grains from for the grist mill products and for the distillery. Very good, and we have a couple questions that are somewhat related. Denise is wondering which whiskey Washington drank, and Todd is wondering if we know what Washington's favorite drink was. Washington's favorite drink was Madeira wine, and he loved porter beer. He drank champagne on occasion. The only written reference that we know of of Washington consuming whiskey um, was from his journey to Pennsylvania during the Whiskey Rebellion. There's a letter from Henry Knox, who had been an artillery commander for him, and he said, the president will drink the drink that's famous in those parts. However, in the inventory after his death, there's whiskey barrels in the, the mansion cellar, so we know he would have probably entertained with it, and he would have been drinking the rye whiskey that he made right here in his distillery. Great. And Cindy is wondering if the copper tools are old or new. This is all reconstruction. So, um, you know, finding an old still would be great, but for safety reasons and other reasons, we have these made by Ben Dome. So these are period design, but modern stills. Very good. And Christopher is wondering if the distillery today and in the 1790s separated heads, hearts, and tails. The records of that aren't that detailed for Washington's time. My feeling is that James Anderson, being a Scot who knew the distilling trade, and his son likely took good care, care of it, cutting the heads and, and taking the tails out of the run so that you have that good heart for the whiskey. We do that today. We make a heads cut. We, we capture that heart and then we cut the stills at a certain point so we don't get the tails in there, the low tails. With the brandies, you, you do redistill heads and tails to remix those back in, take a secondary cut, and we sometimes do that with the whiskey as well on the head. Super. And Patrick is wondering if Washington shipped his whiskey at the full strength that it came out of the still. That's a good question. I've not read anything about cutting the whiskey with anything. Um, they have double distilled whiskey listed, which he called common whiskey. And then he has some that was quadruple distilled that he refers to as rectified whiskey. So rectification can mean a lot of different things in the distilling trade. But in this case, we believe that means it was run through the still four times. So very high proof. And that would have most likely gone right into the cask and then sent out to the, the person buying it or to the taverns that bought it in wholesale. Great. And Susan would like to know how shortly after the Whiskey Rebellion did Washington begin distilling? <laughs> it, was a, it was about three years. So there's a separation there. And that's a, that's a good question because we get that a lot because uh, people get cynical about politicians and I can understand that. Um, but Washington w was an honest man. And so when the Whiskey Rebellion happened, he was president. He didn't even know who James Anderson was. He never knew he'd be involved in distilling. So that law was passed in 1791. The rebellion happens in 1794 in western Pennsylvania and other parts of the country on the frontier. And so Washington has to put down the rebellion. But it was three years later before he even gets into whiskey at all. And we actually have the records of the taxes he paid on his distillery. So he certainly you know, went with the law, the letter of the law. And Lisa would like to know what your favorite batch you've made so far is, and if there's anything new you hope to bake or introduce to your process. 
My favorite batches, there's two, is the, the four-year-old that we just released, which is a blend of two barrels, but our March 2018 run of unaged rye is the best unaged rye to come out of the building. So I think they're both real high quality. Looking down the road, this November, which is right around the corner, we're gonna make our first George Washington bourbon. Um, in the record, I noted that in 1797, while distilling in the cooperage, Washington used some wheat and corn in some of the early batches because he didn't have enough rye. And back then, as a farmer, you didn't want grain to go bad, so they would utilize what they had on hand. And so we're developing um, a, a bourbon mash bill, which Lisa Wickers helped us with, and that's what we're gonna run in November. It's all gonna be aged, so no unaged bourbon, but that will be our, our next new product. Nice. And uh, Ken is wondering if George Washington documented his recipes and processes so you have a good idea of what he was doing. There's no documentation like that. So in the ledger, though, that we have, they noted grain coming from the mill into the distillery, and that's how the mash bill was determined for the rye whiskey. They had all those entries, and they got the ratio out of that. Uh, as far as techniques and methods, there's some early distilling manuals from the 18th century that can show you a lot. We don't know exactly what they did here. We don't know if it was sour mash process or su sweet mash. We do sweet mash. Um, so it's been our consultants that have helped us develop a, a method to use this building properly. Very good. And Lori is wondering where you get your barrels. Are they local area or Virginia wood? It's mixture. So Kelvin Cooperage in Kentucky is one of our main suppliers for barrels for the rye whiskey. But this barrel right here with this rye in it is Zach Cooperage. In, in Kentucky, Athertonville, Kentucky. And uh, Zach's been really good to us, sent us a few barrels. The A. Smith Bowman barrels, uh, I'm not sure the original cooperage those come from, but that's the distillery in Fredericksburg. Those are the barrels we put brandy in or rum in. So, um, but Kelvin and then Zach are our key barrels right now. For the whiskey that we're gonna make the bourbon, we're gonna use um, independent stave, the distillers to select barrels. So those are on their way to us sometime in the next month or so. Excellent. And John is wondering uh, which product you would recommend for Manhattan. <laughs> I think the two-year-old rye or the four-year-old rye would be good for that. Excellent. And uh, Deb is wondering, and this is just a reminder for folks joining us, uh, if we sell our whiskey and where we sell it. Yeah, it's only sold here at Mount Vernon. So there's a gift shop here at the Millen Distillery site. We're about three miles from the mansion. And that's open through the end of October. And then this site closes for winter. But the main shop on the estate, you can buy all of these whiskeys and brandies right there. Excellent. And before we go, Steve, can you just remind us how and when we can visit the distillery in Gristmill? Sure. For the regular season here at this site is April 1st through October 31st. And, and that's a function really of once you get into the winter in a water mill, it's not a pleasant place to take a tour. It's very cold. These buildings aren't climate controlled. And the off season, gives us time to do repairs to the buildings and make our whiskey runs and our production runs. So April 1 through October 31 for this site. Mount Vernon Estate is open every day of the year. There's a lot of great programming coming up. We have our fall festival October 20th and 21st. We have a, a lot going on in the mansion over the Christmas season. So look on the web and, and please come to our candlelight programs or our illumination. Um, every time you come to Mount Vernon, you'll see something different depending on the season. So if you've been before, take a journey back over the Christmas season and see what you can see here. Well, wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us today, Steve. Thank you, and uh, Ethan's gonna help me now, right, Ethan? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, <laughs> very good.